Alki Sharma Upadhyay, let's get started. Gravitas, co-presented by Skoda Superb, best in next class. Co-powered by Star Health Insurance, the health insurance specialist. The Wuhan virus pandemic has shown us how dangerous an invisible adversary can be. Turns out, it's not the only threat that China has exported to the world. Close to 2 million agents working for the Communist Party have invaded governments and businesses across the world. 2 million. These are the findings of an investigation, a major data breach from China. And a rare one. The great Chinese firewall that hides everything from the world and controls the flow of information from China has failed to prevent this massive leak. CCP membership details which show how core members loyal to the Communist Party of China are working as Beijing's agents all over the world. From diplomatic missions to corporate, China's agents are embedded everywhere, influencing policy decisions and pushing China's agenda. On Gravitas tonight, we bring you the details of an investigation accessed by four international media groups. Also on the show, a nurse in New York gets the first jab in America. We'll tell you how the world's worst affected country is distributing its vaccines. The rollout finally has begun. India has cemented a new defense partnership in West Asia. We'll tell you more about the Indian Army Chief's first of its kind tour to the Gulf. He's in Saudi Arabia. Hundreds of students are being held hostage in Nigeria after their school was attacked. The gunman has now been surrounded. We'll bring you the very latest. And in Iran, a teenager has been jailed for photoshopping and sharing zombie selfies. She's been charged with blasphemy. We'll tell you all about it. But we begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. India's Defense Minister Rajnath Singh said the country's forces have shown exemplary courage and fought the Chinese PLA troops with utmost bravery and forced them to go back. The minister warned that unprovoked aggression on the country's Himalayan frontiers is a reminder of how power is being asserted, not just in the Himalayas, but across the Indo-Pacific region. Fighting resumed between Azerbaijan and Armenia in the breakaway region of Nagorno-Karabakh, violating the November ceasefire that ended the bloody conflict. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan have accused each other of breaching the truce. India has come out with coronavirus vaccination guidelines, including vaccinating 100 to 200 people in each session per day, monitoring them for 30 minutes after the shot and allowing only one beneficiary at a time. Along with real-time monitoring via CoWin, India's COVID vaccine intelligence network. As a part of Saudi Arabia's anti-corruption crackdown, the kingdom's anti-corruption agency says it has caught bribe seekers red-handed in live raids. The clampdown has led to top-ranking military officials and low-level bureaucrats being captured, and has been dubbed the Minirits operation, referring to the 2017 purge, during which several princes were locked up in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel on corruption charges. Washington has removed Sudan from a list of state sponsors of terrorism. Sudan has had the designation since 1993, on the grounds that ousted President Omar al-Bashir was harboring armed groups. The move comes after a 45-day congressional review, followed by Israel and Sudan normalizing relations. IAN International Media Report claims that the Kremlin tried to poison Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny a second time after the first attempt failed. A second dose of poison was allegedly given to the Kremlin critic before he was flown to Berlin for further treatment. 
The Prime Minister of Eswatini, Ambrose Dlamini, has died after contracting the coronavirus infection four weeks ago. The leader was 52 years old and was undergoing treatment at a hospital in South Africa. In one of the biggest and most sophisticated hacks in several years, the U.S. government has confirmed that suspected Russian hackers broke into a range of key U.S. government networks, including the Treasury and Commerce Departments, adding that the hacks uncovered so far may be just the tip of the iceberg. 20-time Grand Slam champion Roger Federer is facing a race against time in order to be fit for the 2021 Australian Open. The 39-year-old underwent knee surgery in June and subsequently sat out the year with a view to returning to action at the start of 2021. But Federer has now conceded that the recovery is taking longer than expected. The start of the Australian Open is likely to be pushed back to February 8th, but Federer believes that even the additional three weeks might not be enough. New Zealand have completed a 2-0 sweep of their test series against West Indies after winning the second test by an innings and 12 runs. A late rear guard from captain Jason Holder and debutante Joshua Da Silva had taken the test into a fourth day, but the Windies were bowled out for 317. Victory sees New Zealand climb above India to second spot in the ICC test rankings, and they have also climbed to third in the standings of the World Test Championship. Around 2 million Chinese agents are embedded all over the world in governments, corporates and embassies. 2 million agents. This is the biggest and first of its kind data leak from China and it shows how vulnerable, even compromised world powers are. And before some of you point out, let me say this. The CCP or the Communist Party of China is indeed the second largest political party in the world. It has a lot of members, close to 92 million. Practically everyone and their grandmother in China, they do not have much of a choice. They are members of the Communist Party of China. So two million is not an extraordinary figure if you look at it in that perspective. And yet this story is extraordinary because these two million people we are talking about, the two million that this leak mentions, are hardcore CCP members, men and women committed to the CCP ideology. They reportedly operate as Chinese agents in foreign entities, and that is why this leak is so significant. The database we're talking about has names of 1.95 million members of the Communist Party. As I said, CCP loyalists, 1.95 million, they have infiltrated the highest possible bodies of power and influence in the modern world. This breach spans three continents, with the biggest infiltration in the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia. We are calling it the Great Chinese Invasion. And tonight we'll show you how Beijing is influencing politicians, diplomats, big businesses and citizens of other countries. And like I said, our story begins with a massive data breach. News outlets in the US, the UK and Australia have managed to gain access to a huge database. These are official membership records with names and details of close to 2 million Communist Party members. CCP members do not just live and work in China. They're stationed in all corners of the world. They work with power brokers, with policy influencers, government advisors, and the world's biggest corporates. You won't believe the names on this list and the number of members that each company employs. Let me first tell you about the diplomatic missions that China has compromised. Communist Party loyalists have managed to infiltrate three major consulates in Shanghai the Australian, the British, and the American mission. But these are not the only ones. At least 10 consulates in Shanghai have employed Communist Party members. They hold key positions that potentially give them access to privileged information. They hold designations like senior political and government affairs specialist, clerks, economic advisors, executive assistants. Some of these party loyalists have been employed in these consulates for up to 16 years. And it does not end there. The CCP has invaded big businesses too. The Australian is one of the news organizations that has accessed this database. 
and they found that leading multinationals have employed Communist Party loyalists. The list includes names like Volvo, HSBC, Volkswagen, Citibank, IKEA, Jaguar, Land Rover, Pfizer, the Australia New Zealand Banking Group and Mercedes-Benz. The report also names companies like Boeing that holds billions of dollars in defense contracts. Airbus and Rolls-Royce have also been named. Apparently, they employ hundreds of members of the CCP. Top British banks have not been spared either. Names like Standard Chartered and HSBC. Reports say that they employ more than 600 party members across 19 branches. Another name on this list is AstraZeneca, a pharma giant and a front runner in the Wuhan virus vaccine race. According to another report, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca, both pharma giants, employed a total of 123 Communist Party loyalists. These are serious revelations. And this report claims that this database has details of 79,000 Communist Party branches all over the world. 79,000. They have infiltrated the corporate world, universities and foreign missions. China is tapping foreign politicians too. The Communist Party of China has a special department for this purpose. It is called the International Department. Not very imaginative. Its job is to cultivate relationships and win support for China among foreign political parties. According to one claim, the International Department alone maintains ties with 600 political groups in more than 160 countries. In 2017, the International Department held a convention in Beijing. Leaders and members of political parties from 120 countries were invited. This included politicians from Japan, New Zealand and the United States. And Xi Jinping was also present. He delivered the keynote address. Reports say many participants there signed a statement called the Beijing Initiative. This statement praised the Communist Party and Xi Jinping. The other key function of this international department is training foreign politicians. Last November, they organized a briefing. 200 delegates of political parties from almost 50 countries were invited. And they were briefed about the fourth plenum, a meeting of the Communist Party's members. The foreign politicians were told about the achievements of various provinces in China in practicing the Xi Jinping thought. This basically is a 360 degree invasion. The fact that China is doing all of this comes as no surprise. The extent of this invasion and the ease with which some of the biggest names have fallen prey is indeed shocking. And more than anything else, this data leak exposes how the Communist Party operates in compromising potential adversaries. So how does China run these operations? through a little-known agency called the United Front Work Department. It's a wing of the Communist Party. Its main task is to run China's foreign influence campaigns. It is a nerve center of thousands of small groups seeded across the world. Our next report tells you all about China's global campaign. About a week back, the U.S. State Department made a major decision. It decided to restrict visas to members of a little-known wing of the Communist Party, the United Front Work Department. For years, world leaders have largely ignored the United Front, but they can't afford to overlook it now. The United Front is the driving force behind China's foreign influence campaigns, and under Xi Jinping, its operations have become more organized, expansive, and even insidious. So what is the United Front? At its core, the United Front is a coalition of groups spread across the world. Their job is to serve the interests of the Communist Party. Counter the negative press, highlight the positive and shape the narrative around the Communist Party. That's the official version. The United Front is capable of achieving far more sinister agendas like denying the Dalai Lama a voice. In 2017, the University of California, San Diego, announced that the Dalai Lama will deliver a keynote speech at a commencement ceremony. There was a pushback led by Chinese students. 
Within hours of the university's announcement, the Chinese Students and Scholars Association issued a statement. It said, if the university insists on acting unilaterally and inviting the Dalai Lama to give a speech at the graduation ceremony, our association vows to take further measures to firmly resist the university's unreasonable behavior. A campaign on social media was kicked off. Some argued the invitation goes against diversity and political correctness. There were some who even called the Dalai Lama an oppressive figure. The commencement address did happen, but many believe China had activated a united front group to run a campaign against the Dalai Lama. According to reports, hundreds of organizations for ethnic Chinese people have been formed in the West, with each of them having direct or indirect links to the United Front Works Department in Beijing. Operations of these groups are tightly guarded, often hidden in plain sight. Chinese students traveling overseas for education seem to be ideal candidates for recruitment. According to reports, China's state security police recruited long-term moles from more than half a million students studying overseas in 2018. Sulai Mangu, a student and an American rights activist, was one of those who got the call. Allegedly, the Chinese secret police wanted him to spy on campus activities at the University of Georgia. In recent years, the United Front has been reformed. Reports say Xi Jinping has asked the party bureaucracy to carry out United Front work. As the Chinese president continues his quest for more power on the world stage, the United Front is slowly becoming China's weapon of choice to have its way. Euro Report, we on World is One. Colonies are not established overnight. It takes time, years of meticulous planning, a lot of money and muscle power. The British Raj in India began with spice trade. The French colonization of North America began with seemingly innocuous voyages. The Dutch began trading in Indonesia before they started interfering in Java's internal business. Britain began controlling Africa through local leaders before the Crown sent its troops. Do you see the pattern? Colonizers do not come with a warning sign. They definitely do not take a fixed route. In the 21st century, they come disguised as development partners. Case in point, China. It has schemed its way into countries and has diversified its ex expansionist policy and we've told you how Beijing has infiltrated top firms, how it is interfering with decision making in foreign governments. Now let's take a look at the bigger picture. These are the three eyes of Chinese colonization. Number one, investment. Number two, influence. And number three, interference. Let me start with investment. Beijing is investing in infrastructure projects in 60 countries, 6-0. These countries account for 60% of the world population and 30% of the world's GDP. Between 2013 and 2018, China invested nearly $614 billion in BRI countries, countries which are members of China's Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. Morgan Stanley predicts the number will go up to $1.3 trillion within a decade. What explains China's Belt and Road Initiative better than colonialism? This article in the New African magazine reads, In Africa, it is clear that China's campaign of foreign investment is a new form of colonialism. Malaysia's former Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad once said, The BRI risks becoming a quote-unquote new version of colonialism. This, of course, is before Mahathir bowed down to Beijing and started singing a different tune. You see, this is not the 16th or the 17th century. China cannot use its army to conquer land, although it has tried that too. But a smoother way is to conquer with cash. China lays the dead trap. Colonizers like to project themselves as messiahs. The British Raj, for example, was supposedly good for India, the white man's burden and what have you. The British came with a promise of civilization. The Chinese enter with a promise of development.
which brings us to the second I, which is influence. China manipulates the narrative. It tries to influence. In 2016, Chinese President Xi Jinping tasked the state media with selling the China story. In the last four years, Beijing has signed media cooperation agreements with BRI countries. In Thailand, for example, more than a dozen media outlets have inked deals with Xinhua. 2019 was named the ASEAN-China Year of Media Exchanges. China is conducting media outreach programs in almost every continent on this planet. The aim is simple and the purpose is clear. Beijing wants to tell the entire world that China has good intentions. And like Xi Jinping said at the United Nations General Assembly this year, China will never seek expansion. Of course, we believe him. As we speak, nearly 500 Confucius Institutes have sprung up around the world. In 2004, that number was just one. Last year, the Human Rights Watch said these institutes consider political loyalty while hiring people. Their job is, of course, to sell the Chinese narrative. Remember the role of local rulers in Britain's colonization of Africa. This is history playing out all over again. And now to part three of the Chinese strategy, interference. And we've covered most of it already, how China has positioned members of the Chinese Communist Party in consulates, universities and top firms around the world to interfere with policy making, to influence governments. If you follow this show closely, you'd know that none of what I've said tonight is surprising. The signs of Chinese colonization are staring us in the face. What's surprising is the world's response to it, or should we say, the lack of it. Our next story is from Nigeria. On Friday, armed bandits attacked a government school in the, in the city of Kankara. They threatened to slaughter students that tried to escape. It's been three days, and more than 300 students that lived on the school premises have gone missing. 300. Their whereabouts are still unknown. So are the motives of the attackers. The parents are waiting for the safe return of their children, begging the authorities to save them. 11th of December, Kankara, Katsina State, Nigeria. An all-boys government school is raided by local bandits. Of the students following the shootings in and around the school that sent hundreds of them fleeing. A large group of men armed with AK-47 rifles overrun the school and kill security officials. Student Usama Aminu was about to sleep in his dorm room when he started hearing sporadic gunshots. He ran outside, tried climbing the school fence, but was stopped by men who threatened to slaughter him. When I decided to run, they brought a knife to slaughter me, but I ran away quickly. I ran into the crowd. They couldn't get me. Then I put my clothes upside down so that they could not see me. From there, they said they would kill whoever is trying to escape. Then I began to run, climbing one rock to another through a forest. 800 other students that lived on the school premises escaped in a similar fashion. Nearly 300 of them haven't returned. The motives of the attackers are still unknown. Nigerian authorities fear the students may have been abducted for ransom. All secondary schools in the Katsina state have been ordered to remain shut. But that won't be enough to quell the anger of these distraught parents who have been waiting for their children to return for more than three days. <laughs> Hundreds of parents have been converging outside the school, begging the authorities to save their boys. Our last prayer is to see that our children are back. That is the only prayer. That, that is the prayer that we are doing. We, we, are, we are sleepless. This, even this night, we stood up. We stood up, up praying to God to bring our children back. Katsina, the home state of Nigerian President Mohamed Buhari, has always been plagued by violent bandits. But the attack on school students has put the spotlight on the worsening security situation across Nigeria. In November, 110 farmers in the country's northeast were slaughtered by Boko Haram insurgents. They were tied up, tortured, and then beheaded. Boko Haram has killed many of us. 32 people have been slaughtered. We need assistance. We need some weapons. 
and armed men because we have youth who can volunteer to guard our farmers while working on the farm. Please do this for God's sake. Even foreign nationals living in Nigeria are under attack. Last week, two employees of the UN World Food Program were kidnapped by jihadists in the Borno state. And in the southwestern state of Oyo, two Indian nationals were kidnapped by unidentified gunmen. The Nigerian government, based in Abuja, is being accused of doing little to stop the insurgency and kidnappings. The Nigerian president is under mounting pressure to act. School raids, mass slaughter of farmers, and abductions of foreign nationals, Nigeria is going through one of its toughest phases in recent history. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. We've often discussed Pakistan's decoupling from the Islamic world on this show, how Islamabad is steadily slipping from the good books of Arab nations, especially Saudi Arabia, the de facto leader of the Islamic world. Tonight, let me tell you the story of two visits, two high-profile and very similar visits that ended very differently and that stand as proof of the Saudi-Pakistan breakup. They also reaffirm how Saudi Arabia, along with the UAE, is increasingly lean, leaning towards India. Our story begins in the month of August this year. The Pakistan Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa travelled to Riyadh. The visit followed weeks of posturing by Islamabad on Kashmir. The Pakistan Army Chief went there expecting the Sheikhdom to take a firmer line against India's policies in Kashmir. In fact, the Saudi Crown Prince was expected to give the Pakistan Army Chief an audience, a loan concession and a medal. But all that General Bajwa received was a royal snub. The Saudis apparently changed their mind. There was no meeting with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, no loan concession, definitely not a medal. General Bajwa had to settle for customary meetings with Saudi officials. He returned to Islamabad empty-handed handed, and his visit was an epic failure. Four months later, another visit is underway. On the 9th of December, the Indian Army Chief, General M. M. Naravne, embarked on a six-day-long tour of West Asia. His third foreign tour this year, and the first by an Indian Army Chief to this part of the world. The purpose of the visit was to create a military alliance with the two Gulf powers. And today, on the 14th of December, as General Naravne wraps up the tour, let's take a look at the highlights. On Friday... The Indian Army Chief received a guard of honor at the headquarters of the UAE's land forces. He held talks with the commander of land forces, Major General Saleh Mohammed Saleh Al Ameri. The two men discussed defense cooperation between India and the UAE. The Army Chief also visited the Land Forces Institute and its infantry and armor schools. Then on Sunday, the Indian Army Chief arrived in Saudi Arabia. He visited the Ministry of Defense in Riyadh. He received a guard of honor by the Royal Saudi Land Forces. He met top Saudi generals, like Saudi Arabia's Chief of Staff, General Fayyad bin Hamid Ruveli, and the Commander of Saudi Arabia's Joint Forces, General Mutlaq bin Salim, bin al-Azima. The discussions largely revolved around ramping up defense cooperation in strategic areas. Now look at the stark contrast between these two visits. The Pakistan Army Chief gets snubbed by the Saudis as a red carpet is rolled out for the Indian Army Chief by both the UAE and Saudi Arabia. New Delhi has not only managed to delink Islamabad from the Arab world, it is set to become a major security partner of the Gulf powers. Let me explain. Reports around General Naravne's visit to the Gulf have highlighted a potential sale of the BrahMos missile. Both Abu Dhabi and Riyadh have reportedly shown interest in buying the Indo-Russian missile system. A number of other proposals are also on the table, like joint military exercises. In recent years, the Indian Navy has held drills with the UAE and Saudi Arabia. In the month of March in 2018, India and the UAE conducted their maiden naval exercise. It was called Gulf Star One. In 2019, India and Saudi Arabia announced their first joint naval drills. They were delayed due to the outbreak of the Wuhan virus. The Indian Army Chief's visit could lead 
to a rescheduling of these drills. Reports also say that Indian contingents could soon be sent to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. What for? For the protection of the House of Saud. And this is significant, and let me explain why. Over the years, thousands of Pakistani troops have been sent to the Royal Kingdom. Elite Pakistani commandos have been tasked with guarding the royal family in Riyadh. But Islamabad has refused to allow Pakistani troops to join Saudi and Emirati troops in Yemen. Reports say the Gulf powers now want India to be on board in Yemen. Indian contingents is what they want to join their troops in Yemen. As Islamabad is made to pay back its loans, look at the headline published by Pakistan's Geo News today. China bails out Pakistan to repay $1 billion Saudi debt. Pakistan has been forced to pay another tranche of a $3 billion loan it borrowed from Saudi Arabia. And much like the last time, China has again come to Pakistan's rescue. So let me say this one more time. In its obsession with Kashmir and attempts to please China, Pakistan is slipping from the good books of the Arab world. It has failed to be worth the oil it's getting from Arab nations. And India, of course, has risen to the occasion. It is building on this strategic partnership with Gulf powers. Over the weekend, the United States became the third major power to approve vaccines. Within 24 hours, the supplies of the Pfizer vaccine was rolled out, and today the first set of healthcare workers received the shot. America wants to inoculate 20 million citizens in the next one month. How will it achieve this ambitious target? Our next report has some details. Two unassuming medics in New York have made history, the first Americans to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. They say they wanted to set an example to show that the jab is safe and efficient. It's a moment America has been waiting for since Friday, when regulators approved the Pfizer vaccine for emergency use. But the approval didn't come without its share of controversies. Reports say Trump's White House chief of staff had issued a warning to the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, the American regulator. He was told to either approve the vaccines or leave his position by the end of the day. The FDA gave the nod, but denied that its commissioner was threatened. The first batches are now being dispatched around America. with hospitals now gearing up to administer the shot. An initial shipment of about 2.9 million doses will be sent across the country this week. The vaccines are being transported in special packaging with dry ice. Special freezers like these are being used to keep the doses at 70 degrees below freezing. This hospital in Chicago will be one of the many centers that will inoculate citizens. This factory in particular aims to vaccinate 1,000 people in a day. The biggest challenge is keeping the shots cool. That ultra-low freezer we can only open for two minutes at a time, otherwise it'll go out of range, so we have to be very precise in our movements. And once we take the drug out, we have to move it to the refrigerator within a 10-minute time frame so it doesn't fall into the ultra-quick defrost. If it defrosts too quickly, we only get two hours stability. If we can defrost it slowly, we get five days of stability. Unlike most countries in the world, the United States is following a decentralized plan to distribute the shots. The states get to choose where the supplies go, and not Washington. With the first shots going to healthcare workers and the elderly, America has set ambitious targets for itself. It plans to give 20 million citizens their first shot in a month. With four countries now kicking off their max vaccination programs, the European Union is getting restless. The German health minister has claimed that they are hamstrung by the lack of regulatory approval, with the European Medicines Agency still mulling whether they should approve the Pfizer shot or not. In anticipation, Germany has built up more than 400 vaccination centers and deployed 10,000 doctors. They are ready to give the shot from Tuesday itself if the approvals come through.
Der Minister hat sich gestern ähm, geäußert. The minister spoke yesterday about the approval of the vaccine and said that every day we can start vaccinating earlier, it reduces suffering and protects the most vulnerable. We expect the EMA to give approval for the vaccine by the end of the month, which will then be confirmed by the European Commission and immediately after that vaccination can start. The approval in America may drive other regulators around the world to give the green light too. But the Pfizer shot is not for everyone. Until December at least. Pfizer plans to supply this vaccine in America and Europe for now. Bureau Report, World is One. From Go Nawaz to Go Niazi, Pakistan sure has come a long way. For months, the country has been rocked by anti-government protests. On Sunday, the 13th of December, these protests came to a temporary halt. That's when the Pakistan Democratic Movement held its final rally for this year in the city of Lahore. And this does not mean that the anti-government movement has subsided. The opposition is planning to organize what it calls another tsunami of protests in Islamabad in February next year, 2021. Bigger than the power show they put up in Lahore yesterday. Look at the images on your screen. Thousands of Pakistani citizens converged on the Minare Pakistan. They chanted slogans against Imran Khan Niazi and demanded his resignation. <laughs> There were fiery speeches by opposition leaders, by Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, the chairman of the Pakistan People's Party, Maulana Fazlur Rehman, the president of jamaat e ulema islam and Maryam Nawaz, the vice president of Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz. Their grudges against the Pakistan government varied, but their message was the same. Imran Khan will have to go, they said. <laughs> Also present virtually at this rally was the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, addressing the protesters via video link all the way from London. Nawaz Sharif flashed out at the Pakistan army for its increasing involvement in the country's political matters. He accused them of installing a puppet in the highest office of the country. किस तरह हमारी तारीख की सबसे बड़ी धांधली की गई किस तरह चंद जर्नलों ने मिलकर फैसला किया कि नवाज शरीफ शबाज शरीफ और मुस्लिम लीग नून को इब्रत का निशाना बनाना है किस तरह उन्होंने तय किया कि एक ऐसी कठपुतली को लेकर आना है जो आंखें बंद करके उनके इशारों पर नाचती रहे it was a time when Nawaz Sharif was accused of being a puppet of the Pakistan army how times change as lahore erupted in protest Almost 400 kilometers away in Pakistan's capital, Imran Khan was least bothered. He released pictures of his engagements in Islamabad, pictures of the quality time he spent feeding his dogs at the lavish mansion he owns in Banigala. Following these images were some self-righteous tweets by the Prime Minister. Imran Khan said, and I quote, Pathetic PDM spent so much money, time, effort and displayed utter callousness by endangering people's lives during COVID-19 spike, showing the scant regard they have for citizens, citizens' safety and well-being. All this just to blackmail me into giving them 
an NRO to save their looted wealth. This is Rich coming from Imran Khan. His own callousness has pushed Pakistan into food insecurity, which we've reported in the past. Food prices are spiraling out of control. Inflation stands at more than 16%. Many Pakistani citizens are struggling for a daily meal. Their safety and well-being is under threat in Khyber Pakhtunwa, a province governed by Imran Khan's party PTI. At least six patients lost their life due to oxygen shortage. This happened at a government hospital in Peshawar. More than 200 patients were on a curtailed oxygen supply for hours at the same hospital. Imran Khan talks about blackmail in that tweet. When just four weeks back, his government bowed to fundamentalists and extremists and allowed them to camp right outside Pakistan's capital, members of the tehreek e a radic radical political outfit, blackmailed the government of Imran Khan, blocked a major highway to Islamabad, and held the entire country hostage to protest against France. And let's not even talk about looted wealth. The bus rapid transit project, the BRT project, the billion tree tsunami project, two mega projects, the brainchild of Imran Khan declared scams in Pakistan. There are financial irregularities worth billions of Pakistani rupees in both these projects. And these are only the latest ones. The protest may have been orchestrated by Pakistan's opposition, but the anger among Pakistani citizens appears genuine. And it is set to grow in the weeks ahead. The clock is ticking for the quality time Imran Khan has been enjoying in, as Pakistan's Prime Minister. To Iran now, where a teenager is paying the price for trying to live her life. This is the story of a 19-year-old Instagram influencer, Seher Tabar. She's been sentenced to 10 years in jail. What for? For uploading zombie selfies. She's been charged with corruption of young minds and disrespect to the, Republic of, uh, to the Republic of Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran has often been accused of suppressing its women. This is Tehran's latest victim, Fatimeh Kishwand. She is 19 years old and goes by the name Seher Tabar. She is currently behind bars in Iran. Her crime? These photographs. Kishwand has been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for posting them on Instagram. These photos, for example, were posted in 2017. The makeup made Kishwand look like Angelina Jolie. She shot to fame instantly. Nearly 500,000 people began following her. Iran saw fire in Kishwan's fame. The teenager was arrested in 2019. She was just 18 then. Iran justified her arrest with a range of outrageous charges. Blasphemy, inciting violence, gaining income through inappropriate means. She apparently was also corrupting young minds. How exactly? Was it the makeup? or the Photoshop, or was it just the idea of a female exercising her creativity? The Iranian media branded the teenager as a mentally disabled person seeking vulgarity. Let's remind Iran what vulgarity is. Refusing to criminalize marital rape is vulgar. Refusing to ensure women's safety is vulgar. Forcing a dress code on women is vulgar, as is normalizing physical abuse. And it so happens that Iran is guilty of it all. In 1979, the Islamic Republic replaced Iran's Pahlavi dynasty. The priority of Iran's first supreme leader was to cancel the minimum age for marriage. Ayatollah Rohullah Khomeini also lifted all restrictions on polygamy. On International Women's Day that year, Khomeini had a unique gift for women in government jobs. Wear a veil or stay at home. Nothing has changed under Ayatollah Khomeini. It was not until 2018 that he allowed women into sporting arenas, 
The ban was lifted at the expense of Sahar Khodiari's death and a threat by FIFA. Culture is Iran's favorite weapon in its war against women. Tehran throws around the word whenever it needs to justify repression of women. It is this very culture Fatimek Hishwan set on fire when she decided to wear makeup and hit some edits. Her popularity was terrorizing Tehran. Her sense of liberation too threatening. So the teenager was branded a criminal. She is now staring at 10 years in jail. The price for trying to live her life in Iran. Bureau report, we on World is One. What do Americans want in their first lady? Melania Trump was trolled for her accent. She was called a Russian asset, a trophy wife, a poor little rich girl. Melania Trump was projected as someone who did not fit into the White House. The next in line is Dr. Jill Biden, a first lady who has been in the White House before. She was then the second lady. When incumbent President Joe Biden was the country's vice president, Dr. Jill Biden will also be America's first working floatus. First lady of the United States, floatus. She will be the first professor floatus. And Dr. Jill Biden brings with her over 30 years of teaching experience. But guess what? Some people are still not happy. The Wall Street Journal trolled Jill Biden's achievements. It called her a kiddo, believe it or not. A column by Joseph Epstein questioned Dr. Jill Biden's right to use doctor before her name. Allow me to quote from the piece. A wise man once said that no one should call himself doctor unless he has delivered a child. Think about it, Dr. Jill, and forthwith, drop the doc. It goes on to say, and I'm quoting again, Dr. Jill Biden sounds and feels fraudulent, not to say a touch comic. Jill Biden is a doctor of education. And like I mentioned, she has more than 30 years of work experience, but I do not want to vet her education or achievements on the show. Instead, Here's something I want you to think about. Would such a demeaning and distasteful article have been written about a man? Woodrow Wilson, for instance, had a PhD. He was a doctor of philosophy. He was also America's 28th president. Were Wilson's credentials ever questioned? America celebrated his extensive career. Wilson is still referred to as America's most educated president. From America's first first lady, Martha Washington, to Abigail Adams, Eleanor Roosevelt, to Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama in recent years, first ladies have always played the perfect White House hostesses. The ideal American wife, America's first ladies, have had to give up their careers for an unpaid position of a model wife. Dr. Jill Biden is breaking that chain. When she enters the White House next month, Dr. Biden will be keeping her job as a professor too and she will not be on call at the White House 24-7 because she will also be teaching English to college students. The American media should be celebrating Dr. Jill Biden, not trolling her. Electing a first woman vice president will change nothing if the American media indulges in sexist rants and distasteful headlines. Think about it. We're wrapping up the show, leaving you as always with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.